a great story is one thing, but what about making a movie that unfurls added layers of storytelling and subtext on repeat viewings? It's a tough trick to pull off, concealing subtle, unspoken plot points in plain sight for attentive viewers to uncover when re-watching in the future. But when it works, it really works. And so, with that in mind, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with the 10 greatest unspoken sci-fi movie plot points. Number 10. Doc burned down his mansion to fund his time travel research in Back to the Future. In literally the first minute of Back to the Future, we see a newspaper headline which reads Brown Mansion Destroyed, referring to Doc Brown's family mansion which was burned to the ground, leaving him to continue his experiments in his garage which survived the fire. None of the Back to the Future movies ever bothered to expand upon this, though in the Blu-ray commentary for the film, writer Bob Gale stated that the shot of the newspaper was supposed to imply that Doc had deliberately burned down the mansion as part of an insurance scam. Basically, Doc torched his own mansion in order to collect the insurance money, which he could then use to to fund his time travel research. Though the Back to the Future comics ultimately contradict this, it's worth pointing out that both Gale and director Robert Zemeckis only regard the movies as canon. As such, there's no reason to disbelieve that Doc committed arson to further his research. It fits both the story and the character perfectly. Number 9. Animals are more important to humans now in Children of Men. Children of Men takes place in a dystopian near future where 20 years of human infertility have brought humanity to the brink of extinction. In the film's opening scene, we see protagonist Theo watching a news report in London about the death of the world's youngest person, baby Diego, shortly before a bomb explodes. But if you pay attention to Theo's surroundings seconds before the explosion, there's a fascinating environmental cue which subtly hints at the changed nature of this babyless world. On a passing bus, we see an advert for a spring collection of expensive clothing for dogs, seeming to suggest that in the absence of children, humanity has elevated the place of animals significantly. In our present reality, the prospect of fanciful animal clothing being advertised on the side of a bus sounds ridiculous, but in a world where children don't exist and priorities have consequently shifted, it makes sense that animals would fill the void of importance. As world building in sci-fi movie goes, this is low-key incredible and actually adapted from P.D. James's original novel, which goes even further to have humans pushing newborn animals around in prams and dressing them in children's clothing. Number 8. John Hammond spared expense in his walking stick in Jurassic Park the plot of Jurassic Park is set in motion by mosquitoes. That is, scientists were able to extract dinosaur DNA from prehistoric mosquitoes encased in amber, allowing them to ultimately produce their dinosaur clones. You'll also surely remember that industrialist John Hammond's walking stick is topped by a chunk of amber containing one of the aforementioned mosquitoes. But on the off chance you know your mosquitoes, you'll probably recognize that the mosquito trapped in the amber on Hammond's stick is actually an elephant mosquito, which are noted for not sucking blood. And so there's simply no way that it would be able to contain dinosaur DNA. While some have pawned this off as a mere movie mistake, that Spielberg simply chose to use a larger breed of mosquitoes so it would be visible on camera, there's a better explanation that slots quite perfectly into the overall narrative. It makes more sense that Hammond, a man who claims to have spared no expense on his park and yet much evidence points to the contrary, wouldn't dare place one of his precious ultra-valuable prehistoric mosquitoes inside his walking stick as an ornament. It's far more likely that Hammond indeed spared expense, instead intentionally using an elephant mosquito, which wouldn't be of any practical use to him while knowing that the overwhelming majority of people who meet him wouldn't ever know the difference. Number 7. The T-1000's wardrobe fail because it malfunctions in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. The special edition of Terminator 2 introduces a plot point that's basically cut in its entirety from the more widely seen theatrical release. After the T-1000 is frozen with liquid nitrogen and shot, it reforms into its typical human disguise, albeit with some glitching side effects, where it struggles to maintain its desired form due to the damage it took from being frozen. In the special edition, we see the T-1000's hands and boots unintentionally mimicking the surrounding environment, but effectively every indication of this is cut from the theatrical version, ensuring the vast majority of people who've seen T to have no idea about it. But there is one single clever hint to the T-1000 malfunctioning in the theatrical version. When the T-1000 first arrives at the steel mill at the end of the movie, keep your eyes on its clothes. For the most part, the T-1000 is wearing the same cop getup it wore for the vast majority of the movie, except that it's wearing the boots of the traffic cop it assimilated shortly before being frozen. Basically, the T-1000 has glitched out and combined two cop outfits into one slightly ill-fitting ensemble. It's far from obvious, but a brilliantly subtle indication that the T-1000 1000 is having some serious trouble keeping things together. Number 6. The Blind Man is the Oracle's Guardian in The Matrix 
When Neo and Morpheus pay a fateful visit to the Oracle in the Matrix, you might recall that there's a blind man situated outside of her apartment. More to the point, despite being blind, Morpheus nods at the man who then inexplicably nods back. It's a minor moment, albeit one that certainly stoked its fair share of debate among fans. While this technically qualifies as more of a fan theory than a confirmed sliver of plotting, it's so brilliantly straightforward that it merits inclusion on this list. Though we never learn a single extra thing about this blind man, it's a reasonable assumption that he's probably a bodyguard for the Oracle, pretending to be blind to ensure he can catch any unwanted guests unawares. The man is absent from the immediate sequels, having seemingly been replaced by Seraph, who is undebatably the Oracle's guardian. Number 5. The Soviet Union Still Exists in Blade Runner 2049 both Blade Runner movies are absolutely cram-packed full of fascinating world-building, and Blade Runner 2049 offers up an especially fascinating morsel that's never engaged with verbally. The Soviet Union never collapsed. Throughout the film, adverts for various products are visible, with mention of them being produced by the CCCP, which is the Russian abbreviation for the Soviet Union. It suggests that the USSR is still very much an entity more than 50 years after it fell in reality, though the circumstances which allowed it to thrive remain completely ambiguous. By director Denis Villeneuve's own admission, this was a carryover from Philip K. Dick's original Blade Runner novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Published as it was in 1968, almost 25 years before the Soviet Union fell, Dick could have never anticipated anything other than the USSR continuing to exist, as makes for a rather fascinating slice of alt-universe futurism. In an interview with Time about the subject, Villeneuve said, I went back to the Philip K. Dick novel and explored the geopolitics of the book. In the book, the USSR was still present. I thought that it would be interesting to think, what if the USSR USSR was still alive? What if it was as strong a cultural and economic force as the US, but with different political laws? What if you saw Russian products in the streets of Los Angeles? I thought that would create an interesting distorted reality that would tell my audience right from the start that they're in a different world with different laws from a geopolitical point of view. Well, there it is. Number 4. R2-D2 disobeys Luke because of Anakin in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. In The Empire Strikes Back, you'll surely recall that R2-D2 isn't one for obedience. When Luke Skywalker insists that he remain with the ship, R2 refuses and follows his charge. At the time of Empire's release, this simply seemed like R2 being an adorably loyal bot who knew when Luke needed help but perhaps couldn't ask for it. But in light of the prequels, R2's defiance is viewed within an entirely different, more tragic context. The catalyzing incident seemed to occur in Revenge of the Sith, when Anakin lands on Mustafar with R2 and insists the droids stay with their ship. R2 R2 obeys, but of course, Anakin subsequently fights Obi-Wan, gets horrifically injured, and is transformed into Darth Vader, ensuring he never returns to R2. As such, we can firmly deduce that R2 develops some understandable attachment issues, and by the time Luke tells him to sit tight decades later, he's not going to be left to his own devices once again. Obviously, in reality, this was really a case of George Lucas reverse engineering the plot in non-chronological order, but it still slides together quite perfectly. Number 3. Australia has renounced its colonial history in Event Horizon Event Horizon may ultimately be a film best remembered for its atmosphere and periodically insane gore, but it's also a smartly written movie with some fantastically detailed production design. For instance, keep your eyes peeled at Dr. William Weir's uniform and you might notice the Australian flag looking a little different than expected. The real-life flag is currently a blue field with six stars and the British Union Jack in the top left corner, but the flag on Weir's jacket is something else. It's actually the Australian Aboriginal flag, implying that in the film setting of 2047, Australia ended up rescinding its colonial ties and status as a British constitutional monarchy. It's an attentive and unexpected detail, and one which Sam Neill himself apparently insisted upon, in an attempt to pay tribute to Australia's Aboriginal population. When this was recently brought to the internet's attention, Neil tweeted that he wouldn't do it any differently today, an especially interesting remark given that there have been recent calls for Australia to indeed change their flag and ditch the Union Jack. If it happens within the next 25 years, then Event Horizon wasn't just clever, it was damn prophetic. Number 2. Agent T's Wife and Kids in Men in Black 3 Men in Black 2 is far from a great movie, but it does tee up an amusingly long gestating secret subplot which pays off quite incredibly in the third film released an entire decade later. In Men in Black 2, Agent J is paired with the well-meaning but incompetent Agent T, resulting in J eventually kicking him out of the Men in Black, neuralizing him and setting him up with a cute waitress at the diner. J suggests that T should get married and have a couple of kids, and lo and behold, in Men in Black 3's altered timeline, J encounters a woman in K's apartment with a husband and a few kids. The woman also being played by Alexandra O'Hara, who played that waitress in the diner. The obvious wink-wink implication is that in this timeline, Agent T did indeed marry the waitress and start a family. Even though the man seen in the back of the woman's apartment clearly isn't played by Patrick Warburton, who presumably wasn't available, it's still an ingenious slice of fun quasi-continuity between sequels. 
Number 1. Lambert was trans in Alien Ridley Scott's Alien is a masterclass of subtlety and restraint, despite fundamentally being a movie about a ship full of space truckers who get picked off one by one by a phallus-shaped monster. Though the film itself feeds us only morsels of information about the Nostromo's crew members, James Cameron's 1986 sequel Aliens added some sneaky context to one departed individual in particular. During Ripley's debriefing after being woken from stasis at the start of the sequel, the personnel files of her dead crewmates are projected on a screen behind her. This includes a file on Nostromo navigator Joan Lambert which states that she was born male but given sexual reassignment surgery to female at birth, and that she had no indication of suppressed trauma related to gender alteration. In the film's original theatrical run and on earlier home video releases, it wasn't possible to read any of the text behind Ripley, but the DVD and Blu-rays of Aliens have included the crew's bios in their full HD glory, allowing fans to pour over them ad nauseum. It's certainly a fascinating revelation, albeit also a troubling one given the lack of exact context for why society would give a child sex reassignment surgery at birth evidently without their consent. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed anything, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also head over to Twitter and follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you real soon.